last but very much not least, we're going to hear from Andres Velasco. Um, I want to give him a really big shout out before he starts to speak because a lot of people have been talking about how really what is most essential is not just policy but politics. And frankly, you know, it's actually quite easy and quite fun and quite convivial in a group like this of like-minded people over a nice glass of wine to talk about different policy options and to all feel very smart. Uh, what is very hard is to go out into your community and get the political mandate to implement those policies. That is really the ultimate challenge, and that is what Andres is engaged in, and I think we're very, very fortunate to be able to hear from him his perspective on what's happening. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Christy, for that very generous introduction. My policy people tell me always to be brief, especially at midnight, and I shall do that. <laughs> this is a conference about new economic thinking. A few people today have claimed that instead of new economic thinking, we should be pushing for sound economic thinking. I want to swim against the current. I want to make a plea for old economic thinking. And I'm not thinking of Keynes, and I'm not thinking of Ricardo, I am not thinking of Smith. I'm thinking of a different kind of old economic thinking. That is old economic thinking that took place, was developed, and sometimes published outside the United States and outside continental Europe. I know that if you have a financial crisis, you're tempted to think that A, it is the biggest, and B, it is unlike any other financial crisis ever before. So Americans are to be forgiven for thinking that Lehman Brothers was the biggest thing ever, and that the recession that followed was the nastiest ever. And continental Europeans are also forgiven for thinking that their plight today is unlike the plight of any other country ever before. But, but, that is not true. Of course, there was the Great Depression back in 1929, but I'm not thinking of that. If you look at the world over the last two or three decades, it turns out that there was, as Richard Koo just reminded us, a massive financial crisis plus two or three decades of stagnation in Japan. We have a few Scandinavians in the room, I'm sure, and they could probably remind the world that uh, Scandinavia had its own big financial crisis back in the beginning of the 90s. But, of course, if you're from Latin America, which happens to be my privilege, we have the world record in both depth, range, and length of financial crises over the last three or four decades. So what I want to do tonight in the nine minutes that remain is something that nobody ever asked any Latin American to do. That is to say, if Latin Americans had been consulted on the issue of the European crisis, what might have they said? Um, and, um, and my take will be a little bit like Richard. My take will be, and I, this is my punchline, so if you're tired, you can leave. My punchline is, had you told us we could have told you you were screwing up. Um, and I don't mean simply policy makers could have told you. There's, in fact, a very large body of economic literature, much, much of it published in leading American journals or European journals, much of it written sometimes by Latin Americans, sometimes by Scandinavians, sometimes by East Asians, that reflected on these previous crises, extracted some lessons, and believe me, those lessons would have been very, very helpful if applied to Europe, say, 10 years ago. And I have a list of seven of those, and let me go through them very quickly. Lesson number one. The common currency in Europe was applied by resorting to the wrong political economy model. And I say political economy model because I don't think er anyone ever seriously thought that, the U, that Europe, or you know, the, the current Euro area, was really an optimal currency area in the, sense, in the sense of Mandel. So economic arguments, in my view, mostly go out the window. We're left with political arguments. And the political argument, at least as seen from Cambridge, Mass., which is where I used to reside back then, was simply this. There are a bunch of countries whose politics are lousy. They need a straitjacket. jacket. 
the only way to get labor reform, product reform, regulatory reform, and governance reform in those, you know, free spending, high living countries near the Mediterranean is to acquire a very big monetary straitjacket. If they do, and if devaluation is gone, then, you know, they will have to behave like good northern Europeans, get their house in order. Well, this is exactly what was said in Latin America back in 1979, when another warm climated Catholic high spending set of countries, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile adopted a fixed exchange rate, which of course collapsed massively back, you know, three years later around 1982. Argentina being populated by Italians tried it again. They tried it back in 1991. They adopted not just a fixed exchange rate, but a currency board, a one-to-one -one parity to the US dollar, and 10 years later, it collapsed massively. What happened in those countries? First of all, did the straitjacket induce reform? No. Why did it not? For a very simple reason that will ring true to Europeans. When you fix your exchange rate, you look very safe to the world. People want to lend money to you. Asset prices rise. Credit is plentiful. And who ever saw a country that did reform when money was everywhere, right? So when you're floating in dollars, you don't reform. Or when you're floating in euros, you don't reform. Think of Greece, think of Spain, think of Belgium, think of Italy, think of Portugal. So I could have told you, or many papers could have told you, that the political economy argument for reform as a result of a common currency was not going to work. It did not. Second observation that a Latin American would make about this crisis. Frankly speaking, it is not much of a crisis. It is much, not much of a crisis for the following reason. As the great Argentine economist of Columbia University points out, I'm thinking of a man called Guillermo Calvo, I'm sure you all know him. Calvo points out that the very essence of a crisis is a sudden stop in capital flows. You are going along merrily, sudden pe suddenly people stop lending to you, and as a result, if you're running a large current account deficit, you have to close that deficit overnight, you cut imports massively, and you go into a huge recession. Well, Europe has been in a crisis for three or four years, and Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and everybody else all have current account deficits of more than 4% of GDP. So the basic requirement of a crisis that nobody wants to lend to you anymore, and therefore you have to close the gap overnight, simply has never happened here. Which, by the way, given that our German hosts have come in for some criticism over the last couple of days, is an indication that perhaps German citizens have not been quite as ungenerous as some people in this meeting may have made them out to be. Because somebody has been lending to Spain, somebody has been lending, lending to Greece, somebody has been lending to Italy, and believe me, it has not been me. Um, <laughs> nor Brazil, nor Brazil. Third observation, you really have to watch out for the real exchange rate. As Marty Feldstein pointed out in a piece, a uh, Project Syndicate article about two months ago, it is fairly evident that countries like Greece have an obvious problem with the real exchange rate. Why is that so? Because any country that has an unemployment rate of 16%, where GDP has been falling to the tune of 5% a year every year for the last three, and where you still have a massive external deficit, you know, economics 101, that country has a real exchange rate problem. So countries in Southern Europe have massive real exchange rate problems. And again, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, we have, you know, PhD after PhD after PhD on real exchange rate appreciation. And what does the literature from those experiences have to say? And I'm sure this will be unpleasant music to most ears, it is very, very, very hard, perhaps impossible, to carry out a large real depreciation without touching the nominal exchange rate. You know, there are hundreds of papers, hundreds of experiences, hundreds of very dramatic recessions which suggest that. 1982, in the month of May, General Pinochet, not exactly a soft man himself, said that over his dead body would the Chilean peso be devalued from its parity of 39 pesos to the dollar. He said, 
to show you that is the case, we're going to cut all public wages by 10%. A month later, the Chilean peso was devalued. 10 years later, in 2000 and actually 20 years later, almost 19 years later, in 2001, Argentina was exactly in the same predicament, and Super Minister Domingo Cavallo told the world that Argentina would never devalue. What were they going to do? They were going to go through the pain of a big recession, do internal devaluation, and what would they signal the change with? A 10% cut in you know, public sector wages. Well, a month later, Argentina devalued. So, you know, two observations in some quarters make for a theory. You know, if your public sector says we're going to cut our wages by 10%, prepare for a devaluation. <laughs> and I am aware, I am aware that, you know, there are exceptions to this rule. Eric Berkloff um, told us about the Baltics yesterday. I was not at the talk. But yes, the Baltics may be an exception. But of course, they are an exception that consists of three very small countries next to a very large country called Russia. Uruguay is a very small country next to a very large country called Brazil. It's not quite the same thing. Um, so, yes, maybe the Baltics have shown the way. I am skeptical. And if the Baltics have not shown the way, then the Latin American view would be either be prepared to give up the common currency or be prepared for a very, very, very long recession in the southern countries of Europe. That's lesson number three. Lesson number four. Phoenix miracles happen but don't count on it. Now, for the uninitiated, what the hell is a Phoenix miracle? Phoenix miracle is what, again, Guillermo Calvo, one of the world's greatest economists, calls those recoveries that happen without credit. And in fact, if you look at balance sheet recessions around the world over the last 25 years, you do find that some happen without credit. In fact, Mexico, after the big tequila crisis of 1994-95 is an example of a country that grew a lot without credit. But of course, you know, Mexico is somewhat unusual. It happens to be next to the United States, and it happens to have suffered a massive, 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 massive real depreciation against the U.S. dollar. So no wonder you could ex you know, grow out of the crisis without any credit by simply exporting to the U.S. under a very depreciated parity. If you take out countries where a big depreciation happened, it is very hard to find recoveries without any credit. And of course, in Europe today, the basic problem is that there is very little credit. Not because there's very little money, but simply because the banks, as Richard pointed out, are sitting on very large piles of cash, and they are refusing to lend it. If you want to get the banks to lend, and this is my lesson number five, there are two things that you ought to be doing and Europe is doing exactly the opposite. The first thing that you ought to be doing is should, you should be getting government bonds which are risky off the balance sheet of the banks, right? You want to make sure the banks buy something else than government paper, and therefore government policy should be designed to provide incentives for the banks to lend to the private sector, not for the banks to lend to the governments. But of course, Current ECB policy is exactly the opposite. LTRO is nothing but an, accept, you know, an attempt to get banks to buy government debt. And as Marcus Brunermeyer pointed out yesterday, this is a very nasty link indeed. Once you have banks holding lots of government debt and that government debt is dicey, the chances you will have a bank run or a bank crisis is large. If you want evidence of that, there's no better case than Argentina 2001, which is exactly, exactly what happened. And mind you, as in Europe, a lot of the government paper did not begin on the books of the banks. The government paper was put on the books of the banks precisely when the government was getting into trouble. A few weeks later, the banks were in trouble. A few months later, the country was in trouble. So lesson from Latin America, take government debt off the books of the banks, Europe is doing exactly the opposite. The other lesson from Latin America is if you want the banks to lend, well, yes, do make sure that banks have enough capital, but don't do it quite yet. You know, Latin American countries are Catholic, and therefore we read St. Augustine, and you all know that he said in the Confessions, Lord, please make me chaste, but not quite yet, right? Um, Bank capital is exactly of that kind. You know, you want banks to be capitalized, but not quite yet. If you force banks to be capitalized right now, what they will do? Well, of course, they will shrink balance sheets, they will sell assets, they will lend less, and therefore the recession will be deepened. 
So on both counts of what Latin American countries learned we ought to be doing to get banks to lend, Europe is doing exactly the wrong thing. Last but not least, let me say two things about fiscal policy, and I will stop, and I will win the prize for the biggest exercise in brevity. Oh, no, maybe Sergey beat me. Okay, I will try, I will try. Idea number six, there is no such thing as an expansionary fiscal contraction. Um, I suspect most of the people doing the applauding are British. Um, well, let me take that back. There are a couple of papers which show a couple of examples, Ireland in the 80s and Denmark in the 80s. But what do they have in common? Well, of course, they have in common the fact that they had their own currencies and they could engage in massive, massive, massive real depreciations and therefore you could export your way out of a crisis. However, go out and find a case of a country which had a massively appreciated real exchange rate, no currency of its own, very little credit, which on top of that applied a very large fiscal adjustment, and on top of that, it grew. You know? Olivier Blanchard, who's a very serious man, put his men and women at the IMF to look for that example. They simply couldn't find it. So the idea that you can do that and grow is fairly insane. Certainly the Latin American experience would su suggest that in fact it is insane. What is to be done? Again, forgive me, I'm not Catholic, but I keep quoting Catholic saints. Again, you want to ask for chastity, but not quite yet. You do need, of course, a fiscal adjustment in Europe, but you want it backloaded. You want it in the future. You don't want it in the present. Which takes me to my last point, how to make that happen. How do you make a fiscal adjustment five years from now credible? Well, you do so by adopting fiscal rules. And fiscal rules and a fiscal compact, of course, are the rage here in Europe today. Um, I have bad news for you. A bunch of other countries have been doing the same thing over the last few decades. Some European countries outside the EU, like Sweden, some non-European countries like Chile. This is what I spent the last five years doing. I became the most hated man in the country for a few years by imposing a fiscal rule. Then the crisis came, Lehman Brothers saved me, and I became a somewhat less hated man in the country. Um, so what did I learn about fiscal rules? Well, fiscal rules need to be credible, but in order to be credible, they need to satisfy political constraints. They have to be politically feasible. And in order to be politically feasible, they have to be flexible enough. The rules that in the world have been applied again and again and again have been rules that take the economic cycle into account. They tend to be cyclically adjusted rules, structurally adjusted rules, that sort of thing. That's what Chile has, and it has been in operation for 10 years. Very simple rules are simply not credible, even when they're very tough. What was the problem with Maastricht? The conventional wisdom is to say 60%, 3% was not tough enough, therefore it was violated, therefore it was no good. My reading is exactly the opposite. Maastricht was not credible precisely because it was too mechanical. And it was so mechanical that when push came to shove, even German, even Germany, even Holland, even Finland, every country in Northern Europe violated. So the lesson there from Latin America is yes, you do need to make backloaded adjustments credible. You need to use rules for this, but you need rules that are very sophisticated, that are cyclically adjusted, and that are flexible enough. I am, t I am told that the European Compact will make this happen, but I have learned, having run one of these rules for a number of years, that the devil is in the details. The details are not out yet, and therefore, on that point, I am still siding with the devil. Those are my seven rules. Let me end with one word of advice for INET. INET is in the business of promoting new thinking, new research, new papers for new journals, and that is all good. As a practicing economist, of course, I welcome that, Rob. However, I do want to you know, go back to my initial point. Every single thing that I have said in the last 10 minutes, in fact, can be found in a reputable journal. There are dozens of papers and I'm talking about dozens of papers published in the AR and the JPE, so on and so forth, written by scholars from emerging markets, from Asia, from Latin America, we'll call Sweden an emerging market for these purposes, uh, which made exactly these points. Somehow those points were never assimilated. The sociology of knowledge is such that if it happens in Chile, if it happens in Sweden, if it happens in Taiwan, it's not worth thinking about. So my suggestion is 
you should have a subsidy for the writing of new papers. You should also have a subsidy for the reading of old papers. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much, Andres. I'm glad that there was at least one person in the world who was a beneficiary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Uh, you make me wish I were Chilean because I would certainly be voting for you. Um, but I'm afraid there's one race you're going to lose. You're losing to Sergei, the succinctness race. And I said to you guys at the beginning that Sergei is um, one of my moral compasses when it comes to Russia. He's shown you what a moral guy and frankly, excuse me, Sergei, atypical Russian he is because he played by the rules. So I'm uh, really grateful. Thank you very much. Grateful to the entire panel. It was really fascinating, incredibly wide ranging. You kept everybody in the room awake and listening and on a Saturday night close to midnight, that is no small accomplishment. Um, I was going to take questions, but I think it's too late, Rob. Don't you think? Yeah. So my, let's drink. And uh, my only concluding grace note is to say really a personal thank you to George Soros. I think he's the reason that all of us are here. And hang on, hang on, hang on. At a gathering that really is because of him, it was quite nice that we had references, organic references to reflexivity, to feedback loops, and also crucially to currency crises. So your spirit inspired the panelists, George. Thanks a lot, everybody.